Thank you very much, Dr. Vivek. Um, and finally, uh, we have Professor S. Ranasamy, who is Senior Professor of uh, Institute of Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine, uh, called INSTEM, in National, Cancer, National Center for Biological Sciences, NCBS campus in Bangalore. So he has a, a wonderful topic. He will be speaking about random walks of a structural biologist, the role of curiosity in science discovery. Okay, I don't know why I'm always the last speaker. Um, no, it's okay. And uh, so hopefully I'll try and uh, make it a little lighter because you got an overdose of information, right? I mean, this is enormous amount of stuff and uh, I don't think I'm going to remember everything that either Vivek or Bill said. You guys are lucky if you can. Yeah, I don't think I can. My, uh, I've been spending, I mean, I'm about 22 years now that I've been a faculty member, scientist doing research. And one of the things that always bothers me is when I meet a very senior person who says, life in the old days was so good. Nowadays, all students are so bad, people are bad, everything is worse. Oh, this is terrible. The idea of a doomsday prediction that life is going to end, it's going to be worse, has existed for a long time. It all started with this guy called Malthus, right? 1798, he predicted, 30 years more, we'll all die. Why? Food production is increasing linearly, population is growing exponentially, soon what will happen, they will all meet, no more food, you're dead. Over. Don't worry about population, don't worry about disease, Evolution will take care of itself. But there is something interesting that he did not pay attention to. Right? The guy is, uh, is a good mathematician, but didn't realize he, is, he had a lot of ingenuity in thinking through the problem, but didn't give credit to other people's ingenuity. What happened? Science came to the rescue. Every time people have said, that's it. It is said in the, in the Amazon forest, these tribes, this man has predicted that the world will end today. It has not ended. I mean, we heard that already from Dr. Chirag Desai, right? What do you say? You know, 2000, January 1, 2000, it will all be done. Over. But here we are. See, the idea of doomsday prediction has been constantly there. But human ingenuity is amazing, right? Look at Haber-Busch process. When you have the Haber-Busch process, let me see if I... Thing comes now, it doesn't matter. So the, the Haber Bush process. Ah, it's okay. Oh, I do this one. Okay. So the Haber Bush process works. Suddenly it changed. Then we had the Green Revolution. And then we had mechanized agriculture. Food production constantly increased. Think about we live longer. We live better. Even in Africa, people live longer and better. Everywhere in the world, people are living longer, better, we are happier. You might not agreed with this, right? I mean, because uh, uh, we are all controlled by our amygdala. And uh, we are still, we, in, in some sense, we are uh, primitive uh, evolutionarily. We are programmed to believe that danger is around the corner. Because why? That's how we grew up. We were hunters, we were gatherers. If you don't take care of us, the tiger will pounce on you. So we were very worried about it. And the amygdala was right in the front of the brain. And so still today, our amygdala runs us rather than the rest of our brain. So, but... Facts are different. If you turn on the news today, you will only see bad news. But it's not true, right? I mean, so many good things are going on in life. In fact, there's a fantastic book that I encourage all of you to read. It's called Abundance. And he says, human need by category, water, food, energy, healthcare, education, freedom are all getting better. Okay? Human ingenuity leading because of scientific progress is the only reason why we are what? So what I'm going to do is to tell you a couple of stories in science. Uh, and what I want to do is, there are multiple ways to think about science. One is the way that Bill and uh, Vivek told you, which is, I want to cure cancer, I want to make cartilages. Ah, eh, sure, you know, I, mean, I have only one life. I'm going to have fun, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. If something comes out of it, ah, fantastic. Okay, so it is also generational, right? My father's generation, if he didn't work hard, if he didn't earn money, he didn't have food. My kids don't think that way. 
because they, for them food, clothing and shelter is guaranteed. So I don't belong to the generation where I have to make incremental progress for my survival. So I'm going to take the freedom to explore. So what I'm going to do for me, I'm going to think of science as just something about having fun. I really don't care. I'm going to have fun. This is my job. It's going to pay for me. Whatever comes, comes. Whatever doesn't come, doesn't come. And we'll see what happens. Okay. So there is this song of saying that curiosity killed the cat. But it is this curiosity that saved life on earth, right? That's science. Curiosity, science is driven by curiosity. And, and uh, we have to be curious. And many other things that we do is come. I'll give you some examples of things that have happened in my lab and in other labs where those some of the biggest uh, developments that have happened in cancer, infectious disease, uh, automobile engineering, anything you want happened because somebody was curious to do something, was not thinking about the car or cancer or something and found something that completely changed the way we think about the disease. Okay, So I'll start with uh, a, a movie which I want you to watch. It's about a cockroach. All of you have seen a cockroach. And all of you have seen cockroaches, right? So now I'm going to tell you something about a cockroach and watch this movie. And then you'll be surprised. What is the first thing that you do? You see a cockroach, you take a broom and bang. Okay? Why should you not do that? The cockroach. Uber survivor and arguably the closest nature has come to perfection. Here's how long humans have been around. And this is how long dinosaurs ruled the earth. Now consider the humble roach. Survivor of ice ages, continent breakups and asteroid impacts. A survivor which can go for hours without oxygen, for 90 days without food, and 40 days without water. A survivor which can even regrow severed limbs. A decapitated cockroach head can live without its body for 12 hours. The headless body, on the other hand, can survive for up to 40 days, dying only because it lacks a mouth to eat with. There are 428 species in Australia. The most common is the German cockroach. If one German female moves into your home, you could have 100,000 more within a year. Wherever humans are, roaches will follow, even in outer space. There are rumors of roach sightings on the Mir space station, and in 2007, a Russian roach called Hope was the first land animal to conceive and give birth in space, producing 33 offspring on board a photon spacecraft. Despite their reputation, cockroaches are cleaner than humans. They eat our rubbish and don't typically carry diseases. In fact, the pesticides we use to kill them can be much more of a threat to us than the roaches themselves. And they can actually be good for our health, having been used as treatments for indigestion, tetanus, boils, earache, and impotence. A 2010 study found roach brains have powerful antibiotic properties, killing 90% of resistant bacteria and E. coli. But that's not the only example of roach science. Cockroaches have a reaction time of 40 milliseconds and can travel up to 50 body lengths per second. Human engineers are hard at work unlocking the secrets of their extraordinary mechanics. One scientific project hopes to use this knowledge to make cars that are impossible to crash. Elsewhere, there has even been a suggestion that roaches could be turned into human time capsules. Researchers have proposed translating out books and magazine articles into DNA code, then splicing those texts into the genetic makeup of roaches, ultimately breeding an insect archive of human achievement, capable of surviving millions of years. The cockroach, unloved by humans, untouched by nature, undoubtedly the perfect creature. So, next time you see a cockroach, think about this. So we did. So what happens is that there is this graduate student of mine who sees a cockroach. And most of you would have seen a cockroach with something around in the back that it drags around, right? And what it drags around, just curiosity, you want to know what is in it? It's actually called a birth sac. In that birth sac are embryos. And there are six embryos on one side, six embryos on the other side. And interestingly, there is one type of cockroach uh, and this is just for protection. The cockroach drags them around so that you won't kill the, you know, it drops it somewhere, you will kill it. But there is one type of cockroach which goes a little further. It's called a viviparous cockroach. And uh, what this cockroach does is not only it has a birth sac, it fills the entire birth sac with something, for a lack of better word, we shall call milk. Okay? And the embryos drink this milk. And what happens is uh, they come out of the uh, when they are born, they are fully mature, they are ready to mate. Amazing cockroaches, right? And around 20% gestation, the embryos begin to drink this milk. But around 43% gestation, something very interesting begins to happen. And one of my grad students 
noticed this interesting thing. What did he notice? You know, this is what curiosity is all about. He decided to find out what is inside the embryo. And he takes one embryo and he touches it and it comes out and it's beautiful and shiny in the middle. And he asks himself, what is the shiny thing? So my lab, research, is in an area called protein crystallography. That's what I do. So we take proteins and we make crystals out of the proteins and put them on an X-ray machine and solve the structure. So that we can understand how at a molecular level biology works, right? Can we understand biology from the first principles of physics and chemistry? That's our lab's interest. Now, he finds these and he says, now this looks beautiful, I'm going to touch it with a scalpel. And what happens when he touches it with a scalpel? It just breaks open and out comes hundreds and thousands of beautiful crystals. So he comes to me and says, these are nice crystals. I say the crystals of urea because it's a waste product, because it's in the gut. And I ask him to throw it away, but he won't listen to me. And that's another thing that I want to tell to the students here. Don't listen to your teachers. Don't listen to your professors. They have no clue what they're doing. You can take these crystals, right? And they put them in an x-ray machine and uh, you'll get beautiful data. So these crystals look really, really beautiful. Now. I'll tell you a little bit about technology before I tell you what happened to these crystals, right? So these are crystals are really beautiful, so why should I care? And the reason I should care is because of a technology called diffraction. What is diffraction? It happens whenever uh, something interferes with something else and you can observe it. For example, if you want to observe you or me, we need to have a wave and the wavelength of the observed wave, wave has to be smaller than the object we are trying to observe. Now, if I want to look at uh, a molecular structure at the atomic level, the distance between a carbon-carbon atom is about 1.54 angstroms or 1.5 into 10, I mean 0.154 nanometers, right? Or uh, 1.54 into 10 per minus 10 uh, meters. Which means I should have a wave which will have about the wavelength of that. And the wavelength of that is actually X-rays. So now if I want to look at a molecule, what do I need to do? I need to take something that's really, really small and put it, uh, put, hit this with that wave and I'm going to hit this molecule with x-rays. What happens when I hit this with x-rays? I get a little transformation and some picture like that. And actually this is very, very almost impossible to observe. So when something like that becomes impossible to observe, what do you want to do is to make a microscope. Now what do we do when we want to make something big? We make a microscope. So now what I need to do is to make a microscope. How do I make a microscope? I have an object. I have an eyepiece. I have a lens. I get an inverted image. Perfect, but it's magnified. There's only one small problem. The small problem is, can we image a molecule with x-rays? No, not currently. Why not? We do not have a lens to focus the x-rays. Right? The X-ray that is scattering from a single molecule is so little that I cannot observe it. So what do I do? So I'm going to shoot X-rays and measure the strength of the diffracted X-rays, right? And I, so now I have a large number of molecules and I'm going to shoot them and I'm going to measure the strength of the diffracted X-rays. And then from the strength of the diffracted X-rays, I'm going to go back and see how the molecule looks like. But if I just have molecules floating around in water, it becomes very difficult. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to make these molecules sit one after the other in a periodic fashion. And what is that? That's a crystal. So what am I going to do? I'm actually going to take anything that I want to understand at the atomic level, make a crystal out of it, shoot x-rays on it, and I'll get these little dot patterns, and then bingo, magic happens. And this magic happens because of, again, technology. I can take this crystal, I can get this pattern, and I can do a lot of math. Right? And most of those mathematics was actually developed by astronomers. And nothing to do with this, but they developed the mathematics. We just stole it and use it for what we want to do. And the technique we use is called Fourier transform. And the best thing that does Fourier transform is your year. Your year is, year is constantly doing Fourier transform and you don't know it. So if somebody says, you won't understand Fourier transform, we just tell them, I, I don't need to understand. I do it all the time. Right? So we do it all the time. So you can get these little wiggly diagrams and you can get, get these protein structures. The technology is, the interesting thing about this is, I'm going to shoot x-rays, right? I need to make x-rays. How did I make x-rays? The very first Nobel Prize went for making x-rays to a guy called Ronchon. And he used a tube called a Coolidge tube. And that produced about 100 photons per second per square centimeter. 
Later there was huge developments and today this is what we have in our lab. It's called an R-axis rotating anode generator, whatever jargon it is, and it produces about 10 power 6 photons per second per square uh, unit area. Well, the latest technology, not the latest, but just before the latest, is something called a synchrotron station that, you know, India is the only country which doesn't have one. Uh, Lebanon has one. We can't figure out how to build this one. Uh, India, just they managed to build one indoor which doesn't work very well. Here, you can get up to 10 to 19 photons of any wavelength you want per unit area per second. Now, if I have a very small crystal, if I shoot it with so much of photons, I will get enough amount of diffracted beam that I can actually find out how many photons came from any one place, right? So this is, what is this now? This is, I took this cockroach crystal, little tiny crystals, which are very small because it is in the gut of a cockroach. I take it to a synchrotron, put it on an X-ray beam and shoot it. And what happens? I get these beautiful spots. Now I can do magic, right? I take these beautiful crystals and I take these spots and say, now show me the protein structure. And the protein structure looks like this. Actually amazingly beautiful. It looks like a barrel, right? And there are little things sticking around everywhere and those are actually little sugar molecules and in the middle of it is actually, uh, what is stuck is actually a fat or a lipid molecule. Now I have a protein, all the 20 amino acids are there. In the middle of the protein uh, is a fat, it's a lipid molecule, in this case oleic acid. And all these little side things that you see are actually sugar. So it's fat, sugar, uh, protein, everything is there, it's actually food. So what is the cockroach using it for? It's cockroach food. So the embryos are you eating this and growing and it's complete food because they're able to grow, become an adult. That much of food is there, right? So it's amazing. So how much food is there and what is the calorific value of this food? It's actually superfood. Why do I say it's superfood? If you now make some assumptions, how many calories are there per gram of protein, how many calories are there per gram of fat, da da da, and you take one of these molecules and say, how many kilocalories do I get per 100 grams? What you will see is that there are 232 kilocalories per 100 grams. It's the best possible food you can get. And it's complete. It's carbohydrate, it's protein, it's lipid. And more interestingly, the composition of the amino acids is perfect for what we need for survival. So you can just eat these and survive. There's no problem at all. Now, I can use this for many things and I'll tell you what we can use it for. But I want to tell you, I said, you know, this 10 power 19 photons is great. But the pro other problem when we make these x-rays are they are not coherent, which means they are not in the same phase. Now, if I can get x-rays of the same phase, then I can do this better. So now, somebody decided I'm going to build an x-ray laser. So what we did is we took these crystals and go and put it in an x-ray laser. Now, what happens in an x-ray laser? It can make nanoseconds of pulses, and each pulse of x-ray is gigawatts of electron energy, amazing amount of electron energy. So now what we did was instead of putting one crystal, shooting it with x-rays and collecting all these spots, we will spray a jet of crystals and in this jet of crystals, what will happen is every time a crystal hits this femtosecond pulse of x-rays, I will get this data and once I get a data like this, I can actually go and solve a structure. So what have I done now? Instead of trying to go big crystals, which is a problem, I can make micro crystals and I can take these micro crystals, put it in this new and amazing little toy called the free electron laser, which makes giga electron walls of uh, x-rays into small pulses. So you can shoot into these small pulses and you can, uh, every time a crystal manages to cross when the same pulse is coming, then you will get a diffraction pattern. But if I do this enough amount of time, I'll be able to collect the data and solve the structure. So why did I solve the structure? Right? I call it space food. In fact, today morning I was joking with the students at MG Science that, you know, biggest thing that India has been tooting its horn in the last three years is Chandrayaan. And then we have this great program called Mangalyan. Now, I'm amazing, I'm, imagine we succeed and we want to send a person to Mars. You know, they need to eat. What are they going to eat? They're going to eat cockroach crystals. Why are they going to eat cockroach crystals? Because it's perfect food for two reasons. One is its high calorific value. The other is a crystal is an equilibrium between 
the compound that is in the crystalline form and what is in the solvent form. Right? Now, I want to absorb what is in the solvent form. The concentration of my protein in the solvent form will reduce. As it reduces, now I've disturbed the equilibrium, my protein will dissolve, crystals will dissolve a little more. So it's also timed release, just not timed release, it's released on need. So here I have food of high calorific value, which is released only when you need it, which means now there are two problems I'm solving. I'm having perfect food and I'm having the least amount of waste because imagine, you know, we all eat, we also have to dispose of our waste and I'm in a spacecraft to Mars, what am I going to do? Right? So all problems solved, all because somebody decided to go and find out what is in the back of a, what is this cockroach doing on the back? So this has been like a 15 year project in the lab. Okay, so this is the kind of fun stuff that one can do which will have interesting applications. I'm going to switch and tell you another story. This story is to do with a lot to do with NGS. I said, oh, what, what, what story can I tell about next generation sequencing and something to do with Ahmedabad. So I wanted to find a story that we do in our lab which is to do with next generation sequencing and Ahmedabad and I'll tell you what it is. The vast diversity of life, right? If you think of any color, any taste, any flavor, anything at all in life, biology has figured it out. If you look at the variation that you have in biology, it, almost everything can be done. Any chemical reaction that you think of that a chemist can't do in the lab, biology does it. And biology does it with no loss. It will do it every time correctly. Which just means that it has found a way to figure it out. So if I can only understand how biology does everything, and then I want to do something, and if I have a catalog of everything that biology can do, and if I want to do something, I just have to go look up on this list and say, aha, this thing can do it and pick it, right? How do you do this? So think of the DNA, where all of this is stored as a memory in every computer. And everything, the pro, how, the, how the program is executed, where is it executed, what will be the result of the program, everything is stored in the memory, and in, in this case, the genome sequence. So now if we can sequence every species, and then I can annotate what every piece of every DNA is doing, I have figured out how biology works, right? I have complete information. Now I want to do something, I can say, okay, I really don't care about biology, I'm an engineer, I'm going to begin to design. How am I going to design? I want to do a particular reaction, I'm going to take these sequences and ask myself, I want to take a compound A and make it into compound D, what am I going to do? I'm going to find an enzyme that will make A to B, B to C, C to D, and I'm going to stitch them all together, right? And then I'm going to make it, put them all together, and now I can make A to D, and biology will help me make it with 100% efficiency. How do I do that? It's like a machine. So I take the DNA, I, my D, I, then each, D, each part of my each DNA ORF goes to what you can think of as a part, and I can assemble all these parts into a machine. I can even put control mechanisms in the parts, right? And then, because we know how transcription factors work, we know how regulation works, we know how mRNA controls, so I can do all of it. And I can make an artificial life form, and we call this area synthetic biology, okay? So now we can do all of this and make a piece, but this is a little more complicated. I'm talking about this as a very loosely, but it's a little more complicated because there are several layers that we need to worry about. So the first layer is genes, and genes don't work alone. There are gene networks. Okay, and, and you need to worry about this, and there are control systems, when do you express? And the next level is protein, and protein function, and how they are networked, how they work with each other, how the substrate goes from one place to the other. So there are networks and complexes of protein. And above that is metabolites, metabolic pathways, and pathway engineering. But today, thanks to technology like genomics, mass spectrometry, computational biology, computing techniques, developments in, you know, as he said, development of the speed of computers, lasers, everything, I can do all of this to a reasonable level. If I can do all of this to the reasonable level, then what I can do, I can use this area called synthetic biology, where I can use genetics and start using genes as my building blocks and build new life forms or take an existing life form and insert into in genes that I need to insert and make only what I want to make. 
then you can have non non coding rnas i can put i can modify if i'm going to express everything in a yeast i can now know i know what type of codon bios yeast has and i can use that codon bios i can make yeast so essentially i can do everything i want to do manipulate life the way i want and create life to do what i want it's not i'm not talking hypothetically and i'll give you some examples okay so essentially this area that is coming up is called synthetic biology. And what does synthetic biology depend on? It depends on chemistry, computer science, system biology, engineering principles, physics. And what are the areas it's going to impact on? It's going to impact everything that you know, whether it's chemistry or sensors or diagnostics or you name it. It's the food you eat, it's the medicine you take, everything is going to have an impact from an ability that technology has provided us in terms of understanding genes, genome sequences, protein function, uh, metabolites, all of this. And I'll give you one example. All of you uh, all have seen this, right? You go to a temple or you have a prayer in your house, what do you do? You make food and then you offer it to God. How do you offer it to God? You take hot rice or your kheer or whatever it is, and then you put some ghee in it or fat, or biologically, and then you will put a piece of tulsi leaf, right? And then you eat that first before you eat anything else. And why do you do this? You do this because there are now 50 to 100, 500 scientific publications which says tulsi is very good for health. Why is it good for health? Because it has a fat soluble compound called ursolic acid. And this ursolic acid is fat soluble and it will only be released by the leaf when you put it on, when it is hot. So you put, make your hot food, you put butter, uh, something that is fat on it like ghee, and then you put your leaf, the pores open, and the ursolic acid dissolves in it, and you eat this first, and this has been shown to be cardioprotectant, anti-cancer, you name it. Great, right? Already published, proven. Why aren't we all just eating ursolic acid? The reason we are not eating ursolic acid is because it has 13 chiral centers. Go tell a chemist to make it for me. No chemist will be able to make it. So what did we do? We said, okay, we need to do this. How are we going to do this? We said, we are going to go and sequence the tulsi plant. So we first went and sequenced the entire tulsi plant. And then we asked, okay, now I've sequenced the tulsi plants. What are the pathways that we can use to make tulsi makes to make ursolic acid? So we found out the pathway that tulsi makes ursolic acid. Now, if I start from scratch, like what tulsi does and make it to the end, then I'm actually recreating a tulsi plant, right? I don't want to do that. So I said, I'm going to go backwards from ursolic acid and find out what is it that I can buy in cheap and in large quantities. So we start going backwards. When we start going backwards, there is an interesting compound called squalene. And squalene you can buy in bucket loads and ship loads or whatever you want very cheaply. And from squalene to ursolic acid, there are only five steps. Each step is a different enzyme. Now what are we doing? We are taking each one of these enzymes putting them into yeast. Now yeast is going to make all of these enzymes and I'm going to add squalene to it and it will give me out what? Orsolic acid. With all the 13 chiral centers completely correctly. If this really works, you don't have to worry about cancer, cardiac diseases. If instead of eating tulsi, all of us can eat orsolic acid. I don't think it will fully work, but it's still an idea. Okay? So this is, this is something that we published recently, the Tulsi genome sequence and how you can make ursolic acid. So everything that I told you about synthetic biology, genome sequencing, protein function, uh, all of these, the technologies that allow us to do all of this is going to affect your life. And here is an example of something that's going on to affect your life. You don't, ursolic acid is not in the market, right? Are there other things in the market? Absolutely. Stevia, the sweetener, it's made from a plant. Today it's made in yeast. All the vanilla you eat are coming from three different sources. Most of the vanilla you eat comes from petroleum. I don't, the real vanilla from Madagascar is $30,000 a kilogram. I don't think I can afford to eat vanilla ice cream for five rupees if I'm going to pay $30,000 a kilogram. So what are you eating? You're eating vanilla which is made from petroleum. But today in the US you can buy something called natural vanilla. What is this natural vanilla? Somebody sequenced the vanilla plant fished out all the genes that makes vanillin and put it into yeast and they're making vanilla in yeast. So yeast is now beautiful smelling yeast. You, you pass by this factory uh, in Minnesota, you see oh, a lot of vanilla ice cream here. No, no, these guys are big fermenters in which they're growing yeast which is making vanilla. Right? And that's natural vanilla, so you can get vanilla. 
most of the orange flavor that you get comes from a compound called valanchine that's actually made from yeast. Most of the grapefruit juice that you drink is nutcaton, uh, nut which is made from yeast. The other thing that I'm working with a company called uh, Evolve was to make saffron. You sequence the saffron plant, and we are taking the genes that make the flavor, the uh, smell, right, and the color. And you put all these genes, and soon we'll have yeast that secretes out all the three components that you can sell. And you'll have nice, beautiful saffron rice, much cheaper than what you can get today. So technology always has made life better, OK? Technology is there, but the point is, these technologies are so hard to use. Vivek will tell you, it took me 10 years to learn sequencing. You're not going to be able to learn 10 years to learn sequencing. So what do you do? You somehow need to take these technologies and make them as tools that anybody can use. How do you do that? And that's what we do at CCAM, and that's what we're trying to do with IBOA, is to say, can we let train people enough to use technologies as tools? What do I mean by that? You're not an automobile engineer, but you drive a car, right? Why do you need to be an expert in NGS to use NGS? I don't know anything about NGS, right? I'm a physicist. I don't know anything about biology, but I, I'm working in biology. I just have an idea, and I'm using technologies as tools. I don't need to be an automobile engineer to drive a car. In fact, even if my car breaks down, I won't take it to an automobile engineer. He will say, this is very interesting. But I won't take it to a mechanic who doesn't understand how the car works, but he knows which part to replace. Think about going to a doctor who says, very interesting disease when you're in pain. You want to go to a doctor, the first thing he does is, I don't care what it is, I don't know how it works, but he's hardwired in a spinal cord, this is a symptom, I want to give you the shot, right? That's what you want. So we need to think about uh, technologies as tools so that we can use them to engineer and transform what we want to do. I'm going to give you another example that I, my lab works on. This area is much more interesting. We talked about things. And, and this is, there's a new amazing discovery that recently has happened in the last two or three years. It's called genome engineering. One of the biggest challenges in the world has been gene therapy, stem cells. This has been going on for about 15 years, but there is no stem cell therapy available, no gene therapy available. The reason has been, how do I engineer a gene? And they use viruses, and then they did a clinical trial, and the virus causes some other disease. And people have been working a lot. And then there is this person quietly trying to understand how bacteria works, right? And she finds out that bacteria, just like us, has an immune system an adaptive immune system, which means it remembers when it was infected and can re respond when the same infection comes again from a phage. How does it do it? When I get infected by a phage, I'm going to chop a piece of the DNA and I'm going to store it in some place in my genome sequence. Right? And every time I, uh, a new infection comes, I'm going to make complementary sequence for this and attach to that uh, enzyme that will cleave, uh, a nucleus that will cleave the DNA. So if I make this complement gene, and I'm going to have it floating around, if I get an infection, I'm going to make all of these bits I have. So if I already know this bit exists, I have its complement. Before the phage can multiply, I'm going to go bind to this DNA and chop it off. And this is called CRISPR. What was they working on? They were trying to understand how bacteria uh, save themselves from phage infection. But the biggest contribution came in enabling, uh, enabling us to develop an area of genome engineering that has actually made it possible for us to use gene therapy in stem cells. How do we do that? So this is exactly what happens, right? Here is a, so now, if I want to engineer a gene, like in this blue box is what I'm going to do. If I'm going to engineer a gene to which I want to go to that particular place and repair it, I'm going to make a complementary sequence. I'm going to make this complementary sequence and attach it to a nucleus. So I will actually go to the particular place in my genome where I have a problem, and my nucleus will cut it. And when it cuts it, I can then insert the gene that I want in the correct place. Now I have modified DNA. So all those people who were trying to work on stem cells to solve a stem cell problem didn't solve it. All those people who were working on genome engineering didn't solve it. All those people who were working on cancer didn't solve it. Somebody working on bacteria solve it. So I. Just urge people, don't worry about disease. Just have fun, ask an interesting question, follow your heart, you will find a solution to cancer, you will find a solution to whatever it is. Okay, so what, do I, what, are, we, what, are, we, what, what, what are we interested in? So now I can engineer stem cells, I can engineer fish, I can engineer bacteria. What, am, what, what are we interested in? We are interested in a disease that affects a lot of people in India, which are called degenerative eye diseases. In a healthy eye, you have a broad field of vision, right? 
And then there is one type of degenerative eye disease is called age-related macular degeneration where you begin to see holes because blood clot happens and then, you know, whole thing and you can see. And that is what you see in the middle. But there is a whole bunch of genetic disorders and a whole bunch of proteins called rhodopsins. It's a polygenic disease where slowly you begin to lose vision as you grow older. So you are a normal vision when you are born and you slowly begin to lose vision and you grow older. Actually, one in 750 people in India have degenerative eye diseases. No uh, pharma companies in the West is going to work on it because there is no money at all. So we have come up with this interesting idea that, you know, he says stem cells are there. And genome engineering has come. Can we put it all together? What can we put it all together? I can now take stem cells from the same person. And if I can sequence and find out what are the mutations in the eye genes that causes retinosis pigmentosa for you, I can use genome engineering techniques to go fix the gene. And today, the technology is available where I can actually not do simply fix the gene. I can actually take, say, fibroblasts or skin cells or cells from the blood, make iPS cells out of it, and then fix the gene by genome engineering, and then program them into become sheets of retinal cells, and then I can go put it back in the eye by microsurgery. And then what will happen? I've cured retinosis pigments or, uh, this, uh, from people. Can we develop a process? Can we do this? I mean, this is what we're saying is now what I'm saying, on one side you're, develop, you're doing free research, and the other side you're taking all these technologies that have happened and addressing a problem that you can solve because you have access to all these technologies, and I don't understand each one of these technology independently, but I just want to ease, use each one of these technologies as tools and go to the automobile engineer when my car doesn't work, go to the computer engineer when my computer doesn't work, go to the rocket scientist when my rocket doesn't work, but I want the rocket, I want the computer, I want the... Right? So that, that's kind of the way we will begin to do biology in the application form because these tools are becoming so easy to use. So what is the challenge in the Indian context? The Indian context, this is more for the young people, the challenge is very simple. It's called the fat bottom of India uh, population. We have a large number of young people. And the challenges are going to be enormous as we go. Technology has developed enough to say, Food, we'll have never pro no problem at all. We can feed everybody. Water, we'll figure out a way. Technology will solve it. But the problem I see that we're going to have is how are you going to educate all these young people to be productive citizens? How are you going to provide employment for all these people so that they can be kept useful? Otherwise, we have civil unrest and we'll destroy ourselves without biology playing any role. You can't blame biology now, right? The challenge is very large. And so far, the normal Indian psyche has been is, government will give me job. Government cannot employ so many people. We have to think outside of the government. We have to employ ourselves. And then, if I get educated, somehow I will get a job. I mean, education is a very funny word today. I mean, education is gone. Why? The degree has no value to job. And we constantly mix up skill and talent. How many of you have heard companies tell you all this B.Tech biotechnology, MSc, life science people are useless. They come to my company, they don't know anything. Companies are looking for people with skill sets. I don't think all education institutes should stoop to the level of developing skill sets. They should be creating people with talent. But now there is a fundamental thing. We are producing outstanding talent. Companies want skill set. Should the universities now be developing skill set? Then they should not be universities. Universities should be centers of knowledge. They should be focused on talent. There has to be something else that comes in the middle that takes these talented people and provides them skill sets. And then you, you learn new skill sets as technology changes and new things come. So that's where companies like IBOA and others come into play. There are a large number of them. You know, Indian IT industry developed because of brilliant tutorials and uh, NAIT and TIIT who taught people Java programming. And when Java went and Python came, there were all of them were learning Python. If you have a smart person, you learn Java first, you learn Python next, you learn something else. There is no problem at all. But you need to be able to provide these skill sets to the right people at the right time. Otherwise, you'll be comparing apples and oranges. But the, the fundamental basis of all this is that technology, is a, as a proxy for human ingenuity, it is the key. Those who adopt the technology quickly will survive. Right? I used a press phone, now I can use a smartphone. They will survive. 
those who adopt the change in technology, uh, those who adopt technology will say, those who adopt the change in technology will succeed. I can continuously learn new things. Those who are involved in creating new technologies will be the leaders. So the goal of most of us should be, how do I end up creating new technologies so that I can change the way and solve problems for people. Then you don't need to depend on the government for a job, you make your own job. You can employ other people. Right? So technology is the key, and whether we like it or not, it affects all of us constantly. And, that, and that's the message I want you to leave you with. Thank you, and I'll answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ram. Uh, I will take a couple of minutes before I invite uh, the faculty for the questions and answer. Uh, uh, Professor Ram told several stories, so I will also tell one more. Uh, a wife was frantically searching for something and uh, called her husband who was busy in her op his office that uh, I think I have lost my car keys. The husband calmly said, it's there in your jeans. The wife said that why do you drag my family? <laughs> jeans. <laughs> so we had uh, uh, listened to uh, several technologies about uh, uh, looking at jeans. Uh, the first two lectures were about uh, the machines and the working hands and the last lecture was about thinking brain. So everything is uh, important, excellent machines, excellent working hands and excellent thinking brain. So once I had the opportunity of meeting Professor Ralph Zinkernagel who is the Nobel laureate for immunology. Uh, he was here in Ahmedabad in 2011 and uh, his topic uh, of discussion was uh, Nobel Prize by chance. So nobody gets Nobel Prize by chance. But uh, uh, many a times uh, the students from uh, various uh, faculty in uh, the city from uh, MFARM or uh, MSA Life Science courses, they come to me for doing their uh, fourth sem project, a short project. And uh, uh, they are uh, good at reading the literature, uh, they do the project well, uh, I, I guide them uh, for looking at the clinical data. And then they, when they actually come back with the analysis, if this is what is reported in the literature, and this is a standard deviation, plus or minus two standard deviation. If the result is somewhere over here, they will uh, uh, report with plus or minus three standard deviations. And that's what I encourage them not to do. I try to report what they are actually observing to think about what is the reason for deviation. And that curiosity, as uh, Professor Ram said, that curiosity in finding out that uh, why the result deviated from what is reported in the literature, uh, if they pursue uh, that with her curiosity, they can uh, uh, go and get uh, the Nobel Prize. So that's what uh, Professor Ralph Zinkelnecker had said. I also had the opportunity of meeting uh, Professor Tyler Jakes, who is uh, the director of Cox Institute of Integrative Sciences in Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And uh, the interesting part of his talk was that in his institute, there were uh, uh, biologists, there were chemists, there were uh, software engineers, there were clinicians and there were wings on each floor where the different faculty were sitting and the maximum innovations were happening in the coffee rooms which were there in between the wings. So what is important for us in our country and also in our city, we have uh, uh, good hospitals, we have good uh, institutes of life sciences, we have uh, good institutes of technology, we have good management institutes and uh, we have good software institutes. So we should come together, we should think of some projects. Uh, the biologists will t tell uh, you that uh, what we are missing, uh, clinicians can tell you that uh, in which direction uh, the project should go and uh, if we come all together we can solve our problems and then we can lead the world uh, in doing good clinical work. So innovation uh, has to be there and for that we have to communicate to each other uh, profusely. And I am happy, uh, I think uh, uh, one of the faculty can tell us uh, what iBio can uh, catalyze uh, in uh, bringing all of us together and uh, in capacity building uh, within our city and within our country. So at this point, uh, let me acknowledge the scientific advisory board members of uh, iBioA, uh, Professor Bharat Chattu, uh, who is the professor of uh, uh, genetics at uh, MS University, Baroda, Dr. Tasli Marif Sayyad, uh, he is the director and chief operating officer of CCAMP uh, in Bangalore, Dr. K. Krishnamurthy, he is the head of central imaging and flow cytometry facility in NCBS in Bangalore, 
Dr. Vivek and uh, Dr. Ram, you already heard them. Uh, Dr. Shri Singh is Associate Professor and Director of Research and Training at Alabama State University in USA and I am also one of them. So thank you very much and I uh, request all the faculty, uh, Dr. Bill, Dr. Vivek and uh, Dr. Ram to come on the stage and uh, uh, the house is open for question and answer before we actually break apart. My name is Dr. Pinakin Patel. I am coming from Vadodara. Uh, I am an MD at uh, Bills Biotech, uh, Private Limited. Uh, it's a really a great uh, uh, group of people coming and I'm, I'm really impressed uh, the work that is uh, going on here with iBioa. Uh, I have one suggestion here though, that uh, along with this technology, there is another technology, it's a bio, uh, Luminex technology. I don't know how many of you know about it. It's a bioassay. I think that should be also a part of the uh, curriculum, particularly on a, you know, like a proteomic side of it, cytokine detection and, and things like that. Yep, uh, Anush, I mean, we didn't talk about every technology that is possible. Uh, I mean, IBOA is just a small organization. They just started. They do a few things. Uh, but at CCAM, we have 22 different technology platforms that we work on. Uh, the fact that we talked about facts and NGS and some things does not mean other technologies are not important. The three people you are on stage, we talked about what our expertise is. Uh, I, I don't, as I said, you know, if I want a spacecraft, I will go find a... Uh, um, engineer who knows how to do that. This does not mean one is more important or less important. I completely agree and there are so many technologies that affect our life and uh, uh, I mean, unfortunately I had a fish story too that is about luminescence that I didn't tell you today but that's for another occasion. Yep. Hello, good evening. I'm uh, Professor Sharma from Bhavnagar. I want to know one thing from Dr. Vivek. Regarding the technology you discussed about, okay. is there method validation and some QC program? You, you talked about the sensitivity and specificity is really good, that is quite impressive. Right. But as far as the clinical uh, results are concerned, right. uh, how, how about the QC programs with this technology? Right. So, um, I mean every technology that is developed usually has different levels of QC and validation okay? because the variation that comes in comes from sample, as Bill said, it comes from the instrument, it comes from the people, and it comes from the analysis. And uh, you try to control that. Now, typically what happens is that most of this is developed f in the research field because the stringency that is required, the tolerances that are higher, because we are, you know, worst thing, what's the worst thing that can happen if the result is wrong? Because the experiment fails and you start all over again. But when you get into the clinic, uh, the tolerances are lower and so uh, there is increased validation that is required and, uh, and that takes time. So today uh, microarray technology which has been around since the late 90s, even that is used clinically to a limited extent and there is method validation that is uh, happening or getting standardization only now, okay, so 10-15 years later. And so NGS, uh, although it's happening, we are in the early stages. And so I think uh, for it, but, but the good thing is that once the clinicians are, are convinced that there is a uh, demand for this, this is going to be really useful, then the validation also happens because then I mean, the, the procedures are the same, irrespective of what technology. I mean, you would have to do multicentric trials, you would have to see on what, in what diseases does it work, up the, you know, the assay that you develop, uh, what conditions that is work, uh, does it work on different populations, so the same question. So that procedure doesn't change, it, but it's just that it takes time to, to do this. Uh, but the nice thing is that uh, the uh, instrumentation itself has pretty good tight uh, QC parameters. So when it uh, uh, came to clinical validation, I think I will give an example of uh, ALK testing for lung cancer. Uh, which is uh, useful in determining whether the patient is going to respond to the drug called crizitinib or not. Right? Uh, so, our te testing conventionally was done by uh, FISH uh, technology that has been approved by the US FDA as well as the European authorities. Uh, of late, uh, Ventana machine came in which uh, validated uh, the technology uh, by uh, immunohistochemistry and uh, the result of uh, uh, patients treated uh, tested positive by FISH as well as ISC were equivalent. 
So uh, IST being a simpler technology, that also ha has been approved. Now uh, we are looking at several mutations in lung cancer at a time. And NGS is one of the good platforms. And that validation is ongoing, whether uh, uh, ALK testing, uh, whether done by uh, IST or uh, by FISH is as good as uh, done by uh, NGS or not. And if it is found to be equivalent, that also will be one of the approved tests for uh, determining the patient suitable for resorting. I'm Dr. Rakesh Rawal from GCRI. Yeah. So uh, I think this is high time to create uh, neutral incubators where people from different disciplines who have real passion for science right. can get together frequently uh, where possibly those who are having issues and those who are there to solve the issues can sit together and decide how to go for it. Mm. One more thing that uh, for say any discoveries in natural products. So we have already focused on the phyto, active phytopharmaceuticals always. So don't you think uh, there is a time that we should think for cross-kingdom regulation? That means the plant microRNAs regulating human health mm -hmm. because uh, there are evidences that uh, various plant-derived microRNA are there in human blood. Right. Because uh, our initial work on uh, tobacco uh, microRNA, it has shown some human targets which are majority of them are uh, human tumor suppressor genes. So how uh, you focus on those part of cross kingdom regulation? Okay. So I'll answer your first question and then I'll probably leave it to Ram's uh, to, 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 uh, bit. But uh, we actually already have neutral incubators. Uh, they are called Cafe Coffee Day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, so this is a ritual in our flow workshops. Uh, so we start our day typically at 7.30 in the morning. That's when we meet for breakfast. Uh, and it doesn't matter which country we are in, but this is typically what happens. And then we end our day at some point. Uh, it, again, we don't really, we can't really predict this. But uh, usually we end a lab by, the actual lab ends by about 6 or 7 in the evening. We go out for dinner. And then sometimes, uh, if uh, our friend Krishna is there, then he'll say we need to have tutorials, okay, which will end at one o'clock. But uh, after most of these dinners, uh, we go and have coffee. And whichever city we are in in India, uh, and in fact, the only state I've observed which doesn't have a CCD is Kerala. Okay? Because they have coffee everywhere. Everywhere <laughs> else, there is a CCD, including uh, most remote places you can think of. And uh, we have taken, uh, so once we were in Guwahati, and there is a seed in Guwahati, and we were about 23 people who went into the CCD at one time. So that's a very good new t uh, incubator. It's, it, it's too noisy to discuss science in uh, CCD. The, the, you <laughs> so what need, we need no, no, you need to make a bigger noise. So go <laughs> with a larger group of people, that's it. Okay. Uh, Regulation. I mean, regulation is a very different beast. And uh, one of the things that we have started doing in Bangalore is, uh, in India especially, regulation is extremely uh, fuzzy. And the, the problem exists on both sides. On one side, the problem is, I don't think our regulators are keeping up with technology that they can understand what these technologies are doing and keep pace in uh, coming up with the regulatory mechanisms to do this, okay? So there is one side. And you are taking it to a different level. You are asking now to regulate things which we don't even understand. And these guys can't regulate. Today in India, there is e the easiest way to get permission for selling even a class B medical device is to get FDA approval rather than approval from our regulatory agency, okay? That's the current state. I'll tell you the flip side. The flip side is also there's a lot of misunderstanding from uh, the user side or the inventor side on what type of regulatory uh, uh, test you have to pass. So we have started something very interesting in Bangalore, which is uh, which we call Meet the Regulators, and I can send you information about that. Uh, and, and what we are trying to do is to both educate the uh, regulators as well as educate those who want the regulation 
bringing them to the same platform. Uh, we have done two and has been very, very successful. Uh, and in fact, uh, after the first one, we thought the regulators will never show up. Uh, but we were surprised to see that uh, uh, drug, co drug controller of India, all of them, the next higher level, per first time they send somebody, right? Okay, we will, uh, these guys are calling, we'll send somebody. But now, the second time, the deputy drug controller has come. And this next time, the drug controller says, you know, this is too important. I will come myself. So, uh, and they want to now do this as a road show. And they want to do it in 20 different places in India. We have to work with them to educate them about regulation. And uh, we cannot just say this is the government's problem because we are part of the government. So we're trying to do this kind of interesting things and I'm happy to share this kind of information with you. But I agree with you that, uh, but, but in, in your specific case of cross reaction of micro RNAs from plants into uh, very difficult to regulate and very difficult to control as well. So uh, right now we should not worry about it. Once we have a product that works that you actually want to routinely use on a patient and you have a specific SOP, we will fi figure out a way to regulate it. I think we should not worry about it till now. Uh, Dr. Chiragwai, you mentioned about ALK sequencing and uh, those things. So, keeping cost factor into account, uh, how do you see future of sequencing uh, in clinics? Cost, sorry, ask you the question again. Cost, cost, cost factor. So, uh, uh, fish is costing somewhere around 15,000 rupees. Okay. ISP is costing somewhere around uh, uh, 8,000, 9,000 rupees. Now, it's not a question of uh, one taste or uh, uh, cost of one particular taste. When patient comes to me, I want to look at uh, whether EGFR is positive, whether ALK is positive, whether Rosebud is positive, whether MET is positive. I want to look at number of uh, genes as soon as possible because I want to start the treatment yesterday. Today is this. Right? So, uh, uh, if I wait for each taste one after other, it takes me a long time before determining the best treatment for this particular patient. So, as uh, Dr. Vivek was mentioning, if we have a chip that looks at several mutations or several genes together uh, within a short time, uh, in a very cheap cost, uh, on one of uh, the platforms like Illumina, uh, we can look at several genes at a particular at, at, at the same time, right? So, within three four days, we have the result and we can start the treatment. So, if uh, we validate uh, multiple testing on the NGS platform, I don't think the cost is really going to be this. So I'd just like to give an analogy of, uh, if you think of uh, blood biochemistry, uh, how it was done 20 years ago, okay? And so you paid separately for sugar, you paid separately for SGOT, SGPT, you paid separately for each test. Uh, and now, even if you want to do only sugar, all that you will do is take your blood and shove it into the auto-analyzer, and it gives you 23 different parameters. And it doesn't really cost all that much. Uh, more. So you get information that you weren't doing before because cost was an issue. So it's the same with, with NGS is uh, PCR is the cost scale. So if you do one gene, it's going to cost you so much. If you do 100 genes, it's going to cost you 100 times more. In sequencing, it doesn't. It so how far is the day? Oh, I, I, I want to add to that. It's very quick. For a simple reason, when you do IHC, you need antibodies. Antibodies are much more expensive and they're not scalable. Whereas this is chemistry, chemistry is cheaper. I think in, in two years, you will begin. See, today there are already six companies in India that are offering genomic services. Uh, and uh, the fastest growing set of companies in India in the genomics area is uh, diagnostic healthcare genomics and also predictive healthcare genomics. So I think in five years, uh, this will be routine. So today already in many hospitals, for example, clopidogrel uh, sensitivity, sequencing, routine. But I think the mistake, the reason I, I wanted to say is because there is a confusion. NGS is required to discover the gene. So now if you are going to get a blood thinner and you want to know if you're doing clopidogrel, I don't need to use NGS. I can just do PCR-based single sequencing, right? So sequencing as a tool for diagnostics will become routine in two years. 
next generation sequencing as a tool for diagnostics you don't need it that's a poor idea well you don't need it to do everything but everything. you can still do targeted sequencing targeted. that's what i mean like, you don't need to sequence whole shit yeah, this one behind you. Yeah, right behind you, and then we'll come out. I'm Dr. Pradeep Shet from Vadodara. I'm an eye surgeon. Actually, uh, the, the, the cockroach crystals, in context of that, um, uh, in, in regenerative or rejuvenating medicine, let's say not regenerative, a um, number of stuffs are being pushed in the market at the moment. So if the panel can, you know, uh, clear the cloud on is there anything like anti-aging uh, medicine that you understand in context of what you just presented? Okay, so uh, the first application of stem cells that you would see uh, was in these so-called serum. Okay, if you open uh, any airline magazine, you will find uh, the serum which is anti-aging serum. Right? And they charge you, uh, you know, lots of money for very little amount of this serum. And it said uh, in the beginning that these are stem cells. And then somebody objected to that and said that, you know, where is the proof that this has anything to do with stem cells? And even if I take stem cells and put them in my cream, I'm not going to start, stop my aging. Right? And then it turned out that um, this was actually a problem. They, 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 then they changed the marketing tack. And they said these are plant stem cells. Apple, apple, from apple. From apple, or, or other, other plants also. Okay, so these are plant stem cells that are rejuvenating. Now, the desire to stop aging is, has been very strong forever because nobody wants to grow old, right? And so the rejuvenation therapies even uh, have been, even before stem cells came along, there were lots of rejuvenation therapies. The only problem is that now we are understanding that aging and cancer are very closely related. Yeah? And there are the same kind of mechanisms that play a role uh, in, in aging as they do in cancer. And so if you think of aging as an antidote to cancer, then the question would be, do you really want to stop aging? Uh, I mean, in terms of rejuvenation, yes, in terms of uh, regeneration uh, and therapeutic uh, modalities, uh, this is important uh, in terms of organ reconstruction, tissue reconstruction, uh, this is definitely important. Uh, but in ter and, and that by itself will enable us to live longer because, or at least live more productively a longer life. No, uh, uh, part of my question, part of my question was, you know, pointing at the nutritional aids or nutri uh, nutritional products that are being touted as anti-aging, and uh, yeah. you know, a lot of air needs to be cleared on this. So, in so, case you know, in our context of a discussion, I'll give you an example. I mean, uh, the most popular anti-aging in the West is res uh, drink red wine, right? I mean, uh, fantastic. And what does red wine have? It has a compound called resveratrol, which if you, is supposed to be anti-aging. It, uh, you know, we know how the mechanism of what resveratrol does. You know, it stops telomerase uh, reduction, da, 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 da. Except that I need to eat two grams per kilogram of weight of resveratrol per day <laughs> to stop aging, which is a pleasant problem. I, I just have to drink six bottles of wine a day. I mean, it's perfect. It doesn't work in Ahmedabad, but it doesn't work, it does work in Bangalore. <laughs> So, so I, I, I have a fundamental problem. I think our focus should be on improving quality of life rather than on improving lifespan. I think uh, if, if you look at the lifespan, it has increased dramatically uh, when India got freedom of our life. And people have asked, oh, after freedom in India, what has government of India done? We got everything from the British. It's not true, right? When India got freedom, our average uh, lifespan was 40. 37 or 40, something like that. Today it's 72. I mean, we have done amazingly well. And, and it's in, in, in not comparable at all. So, uh, and it is because of technology. But I think what is going to change now is our focus not on living longer, but if I am going to live till 100, then 
how can I live a very high quality of life? And that I think the switch is going to happen in our focus. So I think ex extending life is okay, but the, l the larger problem that you're going to have is how am I going to live well if I'm going to live longer? Well, if we are coming towards the end of the program, I am Professor Devjani Dasgupta from the D.Y. Patil University. Yeah, my question as an educator, it's not really a question, maybe an observation. You said talent and skill sets, right? So what really, as an educator, this question, what really would you call as Oh, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know the answer. I think, huh? I mean, it's a very difficult question, right? So, IQ, EQ, we have PQ, I don't know what all we have. I don't think today we know what Tix is. I can't tell you what talent is. I can tell you what skill is. Right? To me, I will make a very general connotation as an educator myself. I will define talent in very one simple way. Uh, it is the ability to learn and acquire skills and adapt very quickly. I, I, I make a functional definition. Okay? That's a functional definition of talent. It's a different definition for talent. And this definition is very alarming. Again, I was an educator, uh, especially of the higher level where I get PhD students. We have started, we have found that when I take students after MSc, they are worse than when, they, when I take them after BSc. So now I'm thinking maybe I should take them after class 12. And, and, uh, and, and I think the more and more and more I investigate, all of us are born smart, education has made us dumb. I'm part of the problem as an educator. Because our focus has been on, uh, not on thinking about developing holistic person. And again, I have stories about uh, how we think like this. And this is because of Lord Macaulay. Right? It is historical in this country. He set up India's education system to <coughs> deliver clerks yeah. for the British Empire. Yeah. We have replaced the white man in our government bureaucracy with a brown man who thinks he is white. <laughs> so we need a revolution. I mean, we should just dissolve UGC and give universities freedom to pursue whatever they want to pursue, conduct their exams and give degrees, the market will automatically correct and say students from these universities are good, I will hire them students from these. Instead what we have done is, instead of, you know, I don't want any university to die, but I don't want any university to progress, so I will put a set of lowest common denominator and everybody will do the lowest common denominator. And that is exactly what the British wanted. We are still slaves to the system. We need to get out. I don't think I have the, I mean, I can canvas about this. I can talk about this in public. But the more of us talk about it, it is better. UGC should be abolished. If we do that, that one item. In fact, I was in a very interesting meeting with uh, Professor Vijayaraghavan, who's currently the secretary of DBT. In the meeting of all of the secretaries and all of the big educators, and uh, a couple Sibala that the minister in that meeting asked him, asked everybody, what should we do to fix India's education system? And everybody was giving very serious answers. And when it became Vijay's turn, he made a simple answer. As soon as a child is born, ask the father from which IIT he wants a B.Tech, which from which medical school he wants an MBBS, give them both the degrees. India's education problem will be solved. <laughs> because the child now has an B.Tech degree and an MBBS. Now they can do whatever they want to do, right? Every child has a B.Tech and an MBBS. It's a, social problem that we are unable to get wrong with. So there are, we have to think creatively. I don't have an answer. I mean, this is a very frivolous answer, but hits the nail exactly where it should. This is our problem. So exactly in this context, I will actually like to um, congratulate iBio A. Because I find that this initiative will help stimulate thinking of students. And I, Within a very, very short span, I think I exposed my students and I found that they were so excited with, you know, the workshops. Now the whole lot of them want to do it. So if you expose them and let them think, I think the job is done. You know why? Because we don't give an exam. I mean, it's very simple as that. It's very simple. You're not judged. 
So you're free to acquire. I, I think it's a very, very simple thumb rule. And I think IYA will die the second we start e examining students and giving them a certificate that you passed or failed. <laughs> At least I won't be part of There was some problem with Indian regulation in sometimes in 2012, and because of two, before 2012, India uh, was the favorite destination uh, for conducting clinical trials. Now, when I say clinical trials, I'm talking about the clinical trials conducted and uh, planned by the pharmaceutical companies. That also is very important. That also is science. Uh, if we look at the investigator initiated trial, once the drug is actually available in the market. And if you want to expand the use of uh, that particular drug, uh, investigator initiated trial can help that. And uh, that is not occurring in a big way in our country as it is happening in the Western countries, but it has started happening. So, pharma uh, sponsored clinical trials are happening, uh, investigators initiated clinical trials are initiated, uh, the regulation is improving of late. And uh, the trials which stopped coming to our country have started once again. Our own pharma companies uh, are doing the biosimilar clinical trials. And they are also doing the clinical trials for new biological entities and new chemical entities called NBEs and NCEs. So that also has started happening and I am advising some of the pharma companies, Indian pharma companies in conducting their clinical trials. Uh, so that's happening. So immunotherapy. Uh, Okay, uh, one company in India is uh, offering dendritic cell therapy yes. that is not very strongly and strictly regulated, <coughs> but that's happening. I don't want to criticize that company. They are doing something, right? If you look at antibodies, practically every antibody which is available commercially in any part of the world is available right now or is going to be available in next uh, six or eight months. It has worked in prostate cancer. The drug is called Provage, right? And uh, a number of uh, other indications are being tested. Uh, one of the company from India is coming out with the clinical trial. Uh, I will not be able to divulge you the details of uh, that company or that product. But uh, the, the dendritic cells are taken from the uh, patient. Uh, the tumor cells are taken from the patient. They are co-cultivated in presence of the activating factor. And uh, after activation, that is being transferred back to the patient. And that's happening. You know. Any questions? So, um, both actually, for two reasons, okay? That's the model that we are following. Uh, today, the uh, computers, even your laptops and desktops are becoming powerful enough that small data sets can easily be analyzed with 16 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, you don't really need a lot of powerful computing. Uh, and, but where you do need that, it is becoming cheaper to actually access uh, this on the cloud. Now what is not cheap on the cloud, at least today, but it will get hopefully cheaper, is transfer of data. So if you look at um, the, the, the uh, exist scale, is, the scale of computing scale is cheap, storage is cheap, but what really kills you is transferring a 20 gigabyte file uh, on your server, a 20 GB file, and, and then you pay a lot of money for that. So uh, that, it, that is justified when you don't have the resource. Like if I need to do an assembly with one terabyte of RAM, I don't have that even in my institute, I'll go for, for the cloud. I mean, I do 90% of my computation on this guy. I mean, uh, this is uh, uh, 1,000 times faster as uh, 10 power 9 times more memory 
and ten power twelve times more RAM than the first supercomputer I used, and that was not long ago. I'm not an old guy. So amazingly powerful stuff these days. My cell phone is more powerful than the first supercomputer I used. So. In fact, uh, one of my colleagues is developing uh, apps, mobile apps, for uh, analyzing, or not analyzing, but visualizing NGS data on a phone and cell phone. Uh, on a cell phone. That's possible. So do we have uh, any more questions? So I would just uh, uh, thank you all for uh, being here. I hope you had a good uh, time listening to the eminent speakers, especially Miru who has traveled from all the way from US. And I would also like to thank Dr. Vivek and Dr. Ram for uh, their time, uh, and uh, Dr. Chirak Desai for sharing the session as well. Uh, but just at the moment of uh, thank you, I would invite uh, Dr. B.K. Bharadwaj, Mr. B.K. Bharadwaj to felicitate uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Bill. <laughs> That's for you. Uh, uh, here. Uh, Mr. Chaitanya Vyas to felicitate Dr. Chirag Desai. Jesh by Dr. Jesh by again. Here they are to felicitate Dr. Ram. Thank you. And to He's a real PhD, they don't know. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so, there is tea, coffee, and snacks down in the canteen. I invite you all to join us there for 10 15 minutes and then we, all, we can all part ways. Yeah? Thank you so much. Thank you.